So let's begin then. Uh, take a look at the next slide, which is slide three. Yeah. So we will cover today the application process, the requirements for the program. We'll provide you with more details on the Master of Science uh, with a major in information uh, in library science first, and then uh, the school librarianship program certification requirements. And we will provide you with details on the Master of Science with a major in information science. After that, we also have non degree certificate programs that we will briefly introduce to you and provide other useful information uh, in the process uh, of uh, selecting the graduate education. So that is the outline. And the next, I'm over to Janisha. Hi there. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Think yes. it's okay? Okay. My name is Jonisha Ash. I am the admissions officer for the Department of Information Science in the College of Information. Uh, I process uh, admissions for three programs. That's uh, information science, library science, and data science. And then also the supplementary certificates that accompany these programs. Uh, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about our admissions process and to answer any lingering questions you may have. Uh, first and foremost, for our graduate program, Currently, there's no GRE required, which I know is really important to a lot of people. Um, our admissions process exists in two parts. Uh, there's the application that is submitted with the Toulouse Graduate School, uh, which is the Applied Texas application, that first bullet point there. Uh, this application is where you will pay the $75 fee and identify any concentration you may be interested in pursuing. Uh, with your application, you will also submit uh, official transcripts for all schools attended, even if you didn't complete the program. Uh, this has actually been a little bit of a holdup. Uh, students don't understand. It's like, oh, I didn't get the degree. You know, it's for all schools attended. Uh, for international students, however, we do have a caveat because sometimes those official transcripts are a little bit harder to grab. You can submit an unofficial transcripts, but if you are admitted into the program, you will need to submit official transcripts. Um, so for also for international students, you will need to submit proof of English proficiency, uh, which can be demonstrated via testing. Uh, that's your TOEFL, your IELTS, Duolingo, or, uh, you know, also if you've already completed a higher education degree in an English speaking country. Uh, now, this is not an exhaustive way to prove English proficiency. Uh, so you would have to check the uh, Toulouse Graduate School website for additional ways that that requirement can be met. Uh, then there's the departmental application process, uh, which is submitted via web form on our website. Uh, this application makes it easy to submit your additional supplementary materials as well. Uh, we require a statement of purpose, uh, no more than 500 words, uh, which outlines your background, either academically or professionally, your goals for graduate school, and anything else that you would like to tell us in order to show us that you would be a competitive candidate for the program. Uh, we also require a res resume or a CV. Uh, that's a summary of your skills and your objective for graduate school. Uh, the requirement for this is pretty broad, but you want to submit something that puts your best foot forward. Uh, feel free to highlight relevant work and school experience that brags all about you. Uh, this is not a time to be shy. Uh, we also require two letters of recommendation. Uh, this is from someone who either knows you academically or professionally and would be willing to glorify why you're an amazing fit for our programs. Uh, we also offer an easy web form for you to send out to your recommenders with a number scale uh, to support your application just in case a uh, longer letter of recommendation is less uh, likely. Uh, now, uh, the minimum admissions requirements for GPA, we do ask that you have a 3.0 or higher overall GPS, uh, sorry, GPS, <laughs> GPA, or uh, on the last 60 hours of your undergraduate degree. Um, you don't actually have to have a completed degree. Let's say you're going straight to grad school uh, from undergraduate. Uh, in that case, we need six semesters, six to seven semesters of completed 
it work with that 3.0 on there. Uh, we also look at a completed graduate degree, completed, uh, it can't be in progress, with a 3.5 GPA or higher. Okay, so next slide. Now, this is why I absolutely love our programs. We also offer uh, conditional admission, uh, admittance uh, if you cannot meet the minimum requirements for the GPA. Uh, we still encourage you to apply because we have some options. Uh, so students who have a 2.9 to 2.99 on their overall or on the last 60 hours can be conditionally admitted to the programs. Uh, the conditions of this admission is that you maintain a 3.0 or A's and B's on the first 12 hours of your undergraduate work. Uh, that's essentially like a third of your degree. Uh, you know, you've gotten into the program and now you get to prove that you've got the right stuff, you're serious about graduate school, let's go. So uh, now, you know, here's like point A, point B, and then point C. Let's say that you have a GPA that's below that. And unfortunately, you would initially be denied for the program. However, you have the option to take undergraduate leveling courses. Uh, this is within the range of folks who are 2.62, 2.89. Now, these undergraduate courses, they would be in the information science department. And as long as you maintain a 3.0, you can be conditionally admit, asked to be conditionally admitted into the master's program. Now, the master's program for these leveling courses, unfortunately, those courses would not be able to go towards your master's degree. Um, but because you're because it is an undergraduate course but this is like you know a really good idea for folks who maybe have been out of school for a while maybe they've like been in you know the professional world for a while and this gives you an opportunity to reacclimate yourself to academia um and it's you know a really good way to figure out like you know how you work uh going forward um so i'll stick around uh, at the end of this because that's all that i have uh and if you guys have any questions please feel free to Put them in the chat or you know at the end when we have our question section please speak up uh, if you would like to email me your questions uh, my name is jonisha.ash at unt.edu it's a little bit of a mouthful my name is like actually with my picture if you need to see that or if you have general inquiry questions regarding the admissions program you can also email ci-admissions at unt.edu so thank you guys so much for listening and I will turn it back over to Dr. Zavalina. Okay, thank you. Can I see the next slide, please? Okay, so uh, we are gonna talk a little bit about the degree requirements for all of the program. And we have a general program of studies and we have specialized program of studies or concentrations in both information science degree and library science degree, which we will cover a little later today when we talk specifically about those degrees. But overall, there is 36 credit hours of coursework, and only nine of these are the core courses. We have only three core courses that all of the students in the program, regardless of a concentration or general program of study have to take. They cover the student learning outcomes, uh, uh, proficiencies uh, defined by, by the American Library Association that accredits our programs. And then uh, depending on your concentration or whether it's a general program of studies, you would have to complete between six and 15 credit hours of guided elective courses. Uh, we also have electives. And again, if your program had a lot of guided electives, uh, credit hours, then you will have less of just electives. And the other way around, if only six hours of guided electives, then you will have a little more of general electives. And your program advisor will help you select these courses, the electives, the guided electives too, we help you uh, in um, designing your degree plan to the sequence in which it is better to take these courses makes more sense. The program also has, after those 36 hours of coursework in the last semester, students complete the practicum. That is three credit hours. And that, uh, in terms of clock hours, it varies across the concentrations between 120 hours for general program of studies and 160 is for the 
health uh, informatics concentration, one of our concentrations. Uh, there is a, a, a capstone experience, the end of program experience, and um, we've transitioned fully to the e-portfolio that our students create, basically a website that each of the students starts building at the beginning of the program and continues on, gets feedback on that from the uh, capstone committee, and then makes all the changes, and by the end of uh, the studies, by the final semester, uh, each student will have a good professionally looking website e-portfolio that showcases uh, their work in the program, um, all they learned and uh, their plans for the future and features their CV and things like that. So we included the links you can see on these slides. There's links to practicum, to capstone experience. And as I said earlier, we will share the slides after the presentation. So if you wanted to go directly from from the slide set to those pages on the uh, department website, you can go do that. And I think I covered the, the rest of what's on the slides. Program of study, we have general and we have specialized programs as well. Uh, in the library science degree, master's degree, uh, we have several concentrations. One of them is archival studies and imaging technology. We also have an information organization concentration and uh, somewhat overlapping with that, but broader knowledge management concentration that is uh, being approved currently. And we don't have yet information about it posted on the website, but we will soon post it. If you want to um, ask any questions about that concentration, uh, we recommend uh, contacting uh, our professor, Dr. Suleiman Havamde, who is responsible, who is the uh, supervisor of that program. We also have a music librarianship concentration. Uh, he, uh, that is uh, Dr. Maurice Wheeler is overseeing this one. Uh, the information organization I forgot is uh, um, Dr. Uh, Sean Mixa is responsible for that one. There is youth librarianship. That is uh, Dr. Sarah Evans is responsible for that. There is law librarianship, but uh, I mean, it's uh, we currently this semester we don't offer the, uh, the courses, but we will, uh, we have a new faculty who joined us and will be responsible for the law librarianship concentration, Dr. Sarah Ryan. Uh, so that is taken off the ground. And uh, the next is the school library certification. That is a um, certification program for which the students will need to complete the certification exam in the state of Texas. And Dr. Barbara Schultz-Johns is our uh, chair or director of the program. So she, uh, has all of the information about the program. And uh, she is joining us, I believe, a little later. She is teaching a course right now, finishing up teaching a course, her evening course. So hopefully she would be here for the questions and answers about the school library certification. But uh, this program, yeah, uh, overall, if we can go back just, just for a quick overview, right? Um, overall, um, that requires a completion of master's degree and uh, experience. The students who join this con uh, concentration or certification program needs two years of uh, classroom teaching experience. And um, the, uh, those certification courses for the uh, exam uh, can be built into our master's degree. So that could be combined. There will be Texas uh, Educational Board certification exam for the students in this program. And uh, the certification program is designed to, to, to meet all of these learning outcomes and pass successfully the exam. That would include 24 hours of courses that specialize on the school library concentration. And uh, there are three hours of practicum as well, which is uh, supervised separately from the other practicums. And uh, there is, um, for students who do the school library certification with the master's degree together, uh, there is also nine hours of core and three hours of electives in that program. And as I said, Dr. Barbara Schultz-Jones will be able to address the questions later. Okay, so let's go to the next one then for now. 
In the information science program, we also have several concentrations and you will see some of them appear under both of the library science major and information science program. One of them is archival studies and imaging technology. Another one is information organization and knowledge management also will be a concentration, as I said, it's currently in the process of being approved uh, in both uh, majors. And Dr. Suleiman Halanda is our contact person for that concentration until we post all the information on the website. And we also have health informatics concentration in this uh, major and information systems concentration. So these are unique to information science program. Next, please. And of course, many of our students, when they start in the program, they don't necessarily have an idea which concentration to choose. Uh, that's no problem. We have a large general program. Actually, most of our students currently comparable number in, with the school library certification. The largest two groups of students we have currently are in the school library certification program and in the general program of studies. This one is more flexible uh, than the concentrations. And uh, you can start by exploring your interests around library science or information science by taking core courses, guided electives and electives. And in the process, you may or may not develop a strong focus that you wanted to select for, for the rest of your degree. So if you select a concentration, you know, make up your mind about a concentration later on, you can easily transfer from a general program of study into a concentration program after one or maybe two semesters. Uh, if not, uh, you can graduate with a general program of studies in library science or information science. And we have links included in these slides to descriptions of all the requirements for these two programs. In addition to the master's program degrees, we have uh, graduate academic certificates as well. They can be received in combination with the master's degree. Uh, there are several areas in which they are available. One is for those of you who are interested in managerial positions in libraries, information agencies. There is this advanced management in libraries and information agencies, uh, graduate academic certificate. There is one in archival management in digital content management, in digital curation and data management. They are somewhat overlapping, but have their specific focus. There is a concentrate or graduate academic certificate in rural library management, in storytelling, and in youth services in libraries and information agencies. And we do have a page or a section on the website of our department that uh, provides details on the general requirements for these um, academic certificates. So uh, also something that you probably want to know about our programs are the uh, advantages, right? Um, um, one of them is that there are no, uh, there's no requirement for graduate record examination. Uh, GMAT uh, scores are also not required for admission to the program. And one of the, our majors, the one in information science, is a STEM degree. Uh, for those of you who are interested in getting a STEM degree, that, that would probably be the appropriate choice. Both of our programs uh, with a major in library science and information science are accredited continuously for a long time by the American Library Association. Uh, we have um, our practicums that are required component of the program. Actually, there is a possibility of receiving a waiver for the practicum requirement if you have uh, six or more months of uh, work, relevant work experience that is paid and covers the competencies defined by American Library Association, those core competencies that uh, a degree is a graduates from library science and information science degrees should have. So there's a link to these competencies too. Uh, the only program where the waivers are not possible is a school library certification 
program because that is a state certification agency requirement uh, for practicums to be completed and no waivers. Uh, we award the degrees in our programs three times uh, a year in May, August, and December. We have commencement ceremonies in May and December. Okay, next, please. The cost of attendance uh, of uh, UNT in general, credit programs at UNT and our credit programs, the master's with uh, uh, library science major and with information science major is um, competitive, is uh, affordable compared to many of uh, our uh, other of our peer institutions. And when we've included for you two links in the slides, uh, for the student financial services with calculators for tuition and fees. Uh, students who are enrolled in our program uh, have uh, scholarship opportunities. We have on our department's website, we have a list of scholarships and awards that our students can apply for and can receive these scholarships. And uh, there are also a limited number, but there are teaching assistantship and graduate library assistantships. On our information science department website, we've included a link for you on this slide, this is slide 15. Uh, we have uh, a list of uh, um, assistantships that are available and also the form where you can apply for a teaching assistantship. Uh, and uh, the library, UNT Libraries, also has its own uh, website where the uh, positions are advertised for graduate library assistantships there. But whenever we uh, learn about a position open in the library, we will also send it to our students to the mailing list so that our students can apply. And some more uh, advantages of UNT. Why would we consider uh, getting a degree, master's degree in library science or information science from UNT? First of all, uh, UNT is a tier one research university that means a strong reputation. And uh, it's also one of the nation's top 10 public universities on the rise, according to the College Gazette. Uh, that is a recent development. Uh, financial competitiveness of the programs is something we've already mentioned. Our online master's programs uh, at our department, information science and library science are fully online. So it is possible to complete all of the coursework online currently, but uh, if you want to take face-to-face -face classes, we offer face-to-face -face classes as well. And uh, American Library Association uh, accredits both of our programs and they are fully accredited, which is a requirement uh, when you look for library uh, and information uh, service centers uh, positions. Uh, many of these positions uh, have this requirement of American Library Association accreditation, and that's met by our programs. And we are also ranked, uh, both of our programs, Information Science and Library Science Masters, are ranked in the top 20 in the nation by US News and World Report. And there's more than 100 of programs like that in the nation. And our health informatics, uh, if you're interested in that concentration, it is ranked number six in the nation and uh, is developing. We are getting new faculty, more uh, research going on in this area, more uh, possibilities for working with faculty as teaching assistants and so on. So that that is this. Do we have any more slides? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, the funding opportunities we covered. Yeah, so we have one more slide about where our graduates go after uh, getting a degree in UNT. Janine, could you please move to the next slide? Uh, she said that she's paused. 
Oh. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Do you have the ability to share? Uh, let me try to share. Uh, okay. Share. I think you, yes, I think you do. Maybe. Screen and yes. And I will. Okay. So this is screen two. Let me do the slideshow from the current slide. And I think I'm showing the wrong. Uh, okay. Let me do the right one, screen one. Okay. So uh, that is actually almost the last slide in our presentation. Yeah. Okay, good. So where do the graduates of our master's programs work? Uh, we have uh, a large proportion of our students are international students. So of course they work in uh, countries outside of the United States when they get their degree and also in the United States. Uh, in all kinds of libraries, academic libraries, at universities and colleges, in public libraries, and that includes the rural libraries that we have a uh, concentration for uh, in the school libraries. Definitely a large uh, group of our graduates work in the school libraries and also the digital libraries, repositories, archives, institutional repositories, uh, special libraries or information centers, businesses have these. Uh, also health information such as publishers, library database management, uh, um, companies, our credits also work there, government agencies, some of them go on to continue working there, and information technology companies. And of course, the graduates of our master's program also um, consider continuing their education and going into a PhD program. We have a wonderful information science doctoral program in our department. So that is another opportunity. So that is the end of uh, what we prepared for you, the presentation. And Dr. Barbara Schultz-Jones is with us now. So she would be able to address any questions about the school library program. And uh, we would like to welcome any questions that you have. Please type them in the chat and we will reply to them. So I stop sharing my slides. And thank you, Oksana. Thank you, Dr. Zavalina, for carrying on regardless. And my apologies to everyone. We can thank AT&T for my service interruption. I had in the morning the service interruptions, yeah. There's nothing more frustrating, you know? I just, uh, anyway, we all understand. So uh, questions, how can we, how can we help? Um, yes, there was a question uh, about the courses that overlap. The course requirements will be the same, uh, so they won't be different. Is that what you meant, the course content? Because the course content will be the same. You can just take them for either concentration. Okay. Ah, the, uh, the Houston, the Houston program. Um, it is uh, a little bit of both. So it is uh, always possible to do your entire degree online. Uh, what the Houston program has very successfully done is um, get people together in the Houston area. So yes, they have some online events, but they also will have hosted events, uh, COVID willing, uh, where you can meet people um, in the area. So it was originally designed for a hybrid delivery. So some uh, in-person and some online. And certainly there is, uh, as I say, a lot of effort to, to get people together so that you meet your, your colleagues in the area. Okay, here I'm going back over. Uh, currently a full-time teacher. Yes, now, excellent. We're interested in the school library program. The practicum for um, school libraries is uh, all about uh, mentoring. 
So you work with uh, a mentor who is a full-time wow. school librarian and you communicate with them and complete the practicum requirements over uh, all of your coursework. So you are never asked to take time out from work to do a practicum uh, within the school year. So we meet that requirement through the, uh, through the mentoring program that starts with the first course in the school library program. Okay. Just who's done full time. Yep. So yeah, the practicum is done throughout the year. And we got the priority deadlines. Dual degree programs. That's an that's an interesting um, question. Um, I'm just going to see if Rachel's answering that. Um, can I answer it verbally? Is that okay? Yes, of course. Please. Yeah. I want to type it all out. Um, so UNT allows for a second master's degree, and the coursework for that second master's degree can overlap with your first master's. Uh, so if you do your master's in, let's say, history at UNT, uh, up to 12 hours can overlap between the two degrees but it has to be approved by both departments and the graduate school. So it would just depend on what you're looking at. And uh, it would make sense for maybe someone interested in doing like academic libraries or working in an archive to do a master's in either like art education or, or museums or history or something like that. Um, between library science and information science, those two majors, we do not allow students to do both of them. Like they have to choose one choose. or the other. And um, like, I, I kind of answered it in the chat, but just speaking to like the difference between the programs, like the school library program, students can choose either major and that's fine. But for the general programs and the other concentrations, it will depend on their concentration, like which guided electives they'll take within the major. So I just wanted to let everyone know that we do make a distinction between the guided electives based on the major that's selected on application. Great, thanks, Rachel. Now, when are the online courses scheduled is a, another excellent question. Um, we of course work within the framework of a, of a semester and uh, the online courses, depending on which, on which course you're taking, uh, are intended to be asynchronous. So you are uh, within uh, assignment deadlines, progressing through the, the content and then uh, each instructor will typically schedule uh, time with uh, the class. And that is scheduled uh, once the class has started, it will be scheduled to, at a time that's convenient for everyone. So for example, before joining, before I couldn't join this class, I spent an hour with one of my courses doing a chat session to answer questions and I meet with them every week. They, don't, they are not required to attend. I record the sessions and post the recording so they can always go back and play it again. If an instructor makes it mandatory for online attendance for scheduled meetings, that must be announced in the course um, schedule at the time that you register. So you would know that ahead of time. Otherwise, as I say, um, having a course chats and, and regular sessions together are uh, scheduled in conjunction with the, with the students in the class. And that, as I say, is, is intended to be uh, convenient. So since I know that most of my students are working, teaching, the sessions that, that I uh, coordinate are in the evenings. Uh, oh, that's interesting. If I concentrate in archives, will I have major gaps in my education that would prevent me from, no, I don't, I don't think so at all. 
you'd have a wonderful specialty, but it would definitely uh, help you. Uh, you would definitely be able to get a typical position. Yeah, not, not a worry. Okay. Oh, I'm just gonna make sure. Oh, for the statement of purpose, uh, Janisha, maybe you can answer for what admissions, because Janisha is our admissions expert. I, I did a little bit of a, you know, a long paragraph <laughs> inside oh, of the chat, but, you know, other people may be having that question either and, and you know, won't be able to monitor. Uh, we're looking for, you know, essentially three to 500 words uh, telling about what your interests are in the master's program and just basically reviewing your professional goals. Um, you know, I actually see a lot of people who kind of like start off with the flowery ever since I was a child. We don't need to see all of that. It's like we're already in graduate <laughs> school. We know, you know, we're going forward and like, you know, we're you're probably doing this because you know that education education is the route that you want to go and enhance your career. Uh, and so, you know, three to 500 words, pretty succinct, introduce yourself, let us know where you're coming from, where you're going, and how you think this program is going to get you there. Um, I, you know, there are some folks, you know, they've sent some stuff that's like, you know, it's essentially like a bullet point list, not necessarily what I'm looking for. So like, you know, I'll shoot that back to them. Uh, and I'm also not looking to find out like, you know, what's going on with your ancestors. It, we don't care about that. You know, tell me how, you know, this program is going to uh, support you and, you know, meet and help you meet your professional goals. Uh, and that's all I have to say about that. So. Okay, I'm just going through our the questions, just making sure that we're, you know, it, 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 the question about uh, preferring online versus face-to-face uh, -face really uh, depends on your learning style and also your work situation and your, uh, you know, where you're, where you're living. Um, I am the director of the school library program and we have teachers all over the state of Texas. So um, expecting uh, those students to come to class face-to-face -face isn't realistic. And we try very hard to make our online courses engaging and uh, personable so that people feel that they are actively involved as they would in a face-to-face -face situation. But, um, it, it does depend on, yes, your learning preference, but also, you know, your, your work situation as well. Right. And um, I would, I would like to kind of jump on that, Dr. Schultz, just real quick. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, is that some of our programs are more in demand face-to-face -face than others, as far as the concentrations. So we offer more courses face-to-face -face for information systems and health informatics. Right. Um, and then for other programs, we offer more classes online because that's where the demand has been for our students. Um, if that starts to shift, then we may start to change, you know, our scheduling. But at the moment, most of our programs, like the demand has been for online courses. So that's what we're offering. So, but that can change based off the market needs. Yeah, we try to be sensitive to, you know, what our students need. So um, we, we do have that uh, variety. Uh, Rachel, did you answer Omar's question about the sealed official transcripts going directly to the Toulouse Graduate School? Yeah. Did somebody answer that? No, I did not. But yeah, they can go straight. The grad school address is actually included on the department admissions page information. It has like step one and what to do and where to send it. And then step two, like where to send your department materials and how to get them to us. So the okay. official grad school address should be there. Okay, good. Um, I, good question, Stephanie, about Oklahoma uh, residents. Um, we don't have um, special opportunities as, as such, other than, of course, you are very welcome to, to join us. Uh, I'm not aware of having gatherings in Oklahoma in the past. That, that would be something that, uh, that we should think about. 
um, because I know we do have some students who join us from Oklahoma. Uh, tuition, you would be considered out of state. So that would, there would not be uh, any special consideration uh, in that regard. There is something called the academic common market, which right. I think exists with Oklahoma, but we also use the out-of-state teaching fee, which for our out-of-state students, it's significantly less than out-of-state tuition. So um, it's, yeah, so it would not be that much more than our in-state rates. Yeah. And um, Stephanie's making the point that she works evenings at her library. And if the live sessions um, overlap with your work hours, the sessions are always recorded. So you would be able to, you know, um, visit the, the session again later. But also, uh, again, those are those sessions are scheduled in conjunction with our students. So we try to make sure that, you know, we're maybe mixing it up a bit. So if somebody can't make it in the evenings, maybe we'll do it, uh, you know, in the afternoon or even on a, on a Saturday um, as well. So, but if you can't make a live session, there will be a recording. Now these on the uh, letters of recommendation, they are submitted online, yeah? There are, uh, I believe, yes. I believe Omar was actually specifically asking about official transcripts okay. and, oh, sorry. Uh, no, I missed the letters of recommendation question. I apologize. I was answering okay. someone else's. Uh, <laughs> the letters of recommendation yeah. are submitted online. That's completely fine, yes. Yeah. <laughs> No worries, lots of questions, this is great. Um, yes, there are, there are current students who are working full-time and are considered a full-time student, but uh, you know, life is very limited uh, when you, when you choose, make that choice uh, because our coursework is um, you know, designed for uh, everybody to be paying attention. So, uh, yeah, taking working full time and taking a full time load. That's that's a challenge. That's yeah, a challenge. I want, can I jump in again? I'm sorry. I, I hate that's to, okay. Yeah, good. But um, I would say it's very uncommon. And graduate level courses are weighted. I don't know if it was emphasized earlier, but they are weighted more heavily than undergraduate level courses. So taking a full course load with a full time work schedule and then the other life situations that may be, you know, going on like a family or friends or laundry and dinner and all those other things that you have to account for. Um, it can be a lot. So if you're strictly going to work and doing school and that's it, then it can be done, but it is, it's going to take it's up. It's demanding. It's demanding. Yeah. Um, Phoebe's asking about student student groups, uh, and we have student associations. Uh, are you thinking? Are you thinking of? Um, whoops, there we go. Are you thinking of uh, a particular type of uh, of working group? Um, I'm not quite sure what you would mean by that. There, there are groups that work together within courses and we have student associations that give you an opportunity to meet and um, yeah, socialize, but also uh, work together with other students in the program. Um, I'm not sure if that, if that helps or if that answers what you mean. Oh yeah, student associations. Yeah, uh, we have uh, one called uh, LISA, the Library and Information Science uh, Student Association. And uh, yes, and Dr. Zeveline is talking about the uh, North Texas chapter for the Association for Information Science and Technology. And 
that group actually won an award, didn't they, for one of the more active uh, sections in the association. So we, we uh, as faculty, uh, really support these student associations. That is another, uh, yes, there is a place on the website that does identify the different concentrations and, and the courses that are needed. Um, I think that your question about courses that highlight diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, we uh, work very hard to uh, integrate diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging into uh, our coursework. We don't have one that is identified as that course. Um, but as I say, we, uh, and we are actually currently doing another review to look for additional um, opportunities to be sure that we are uh, not just diverse, but highlighting how libraries are connected to DEI and B. So I hope that that it, that answers that. But uh, it is an important uh, component of our lives. So our coursework as well. Okay. Oh, there's a new student group on knowledge management. Oh, that's great. I'm glad to see that. Yeah, culturally diverse uh, communities, we also have a lot of literature uh, courses that are uh, focused on um, diverse communities, diverse literature. Uh, I think we have at least three of those, of those courses. Hands on. Um, yeah, the hands on experience opportunities um, for online students, we definitely uh, encourage uh, volunteering, for example, because that's a great way to uh, have those practical experiences uh, beyond, beyond a practicum. Uh, and there are certainly assignments uh, within the courses that require you to uh, interview people, to uh, you know, connect with people sort of outside of your own online home. So um, yeah, I, I will say that COVID has certainly had an impact on uh, all of those uh, experiences and opportunities that we built into the courses originally. So, that's uh, hey, Dr. Schultz Jones, I wanted to jump in uh, to mention something. Um, we also have uh, Dr. Piercy, uh, Do uh, Dr. Agnes Piercy, who uh, her thing is uh, her specialty is out of state students. Um, and so uh, if you're if you're not within, you know, the confines of Texas, uh, uh, Dr. Percy is a really good person to talk to you about connecting you with a cohort uh, that would be like close to you. We do have like a New England cohort. Uh, we also have uh, like on the West Coast, I, I, I'm forgetting, I'm That's ghosting on all the cohorts. That's all together. Um, so uh, no, that's yeah, another way totally that you can like connect version, with other so. folks. I'm gonna mute Stacy here. Yeah, okay, there we go. Sorry. Um, so uh, uh, that's another way that you can connect with uh, other folks who are like, you know, getting together and that way you can, you know, it, graduate school is not an individual experience. You can also connect with folks and get more hands-on experience in that way. I'm really glad you mentioned uh, Dr. Piercy because she just recently encouraged uh, the students in that New England cohort to attend one of the um, in-person sessions. They were, they were doing some library education uh, related. So rather than a webinar, it was going to be in person. So uh, there's Agnes right there. Ah. Dr. Piercy, hello. Hi there, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, hi. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I was late. I 
I teach another class for uh, somewhere else, and I, I'm sorry I was late, but I'm so glad that uh, Janine mentioned the cohorts because, yes, I think it's a great opportunity for uh, those of the students who are in relative proximity in a geographic, in the same geographic area to meet. And currently, uh, actually, in a couple of weeks, I will be attending the NILA conference, which is the New England Library Association conference. And a week later, I will be attending the Virginia Library Association Conference in Richmond, Virginia. And since we have cohorts in both areas, uh, Dr. Chen, our uh, department had graciously offered that the department would pay registration fees for the students to attend. So we can combine this uh, professional opportunity to attend the conference with our cohort event. And I can tell that, you know, uh, the students are very excited about it. Of course, not everybody's gonna make it because some of them still have concerns about COVID or they have other things going on, but uh, the Virginia cohort never had a chance to meet because of COVID. So we had our first get together virtually and now they are very happy that we will get to see each other. And the New England cohort that started two years ago, we had a meeting in person, but we couldn't do the next one in person. So now they they have a chance to meet again. So uh, yeah, we we definitely encourage uh, the building of some uh, smaller uh, learning communities. And as I understand, my new current task is really just to identify uh, other areas within the country where students uh, would be willing to come to these in person events. So it's it's in progress and we'll see. But uh, if there is interest, uh, I'm definitely interested in organizing more in-person events just that uh, you guys can get to know each other and some local, uh, you know, local professionals as well. Well, that's great. Thank you. And that also extends to our Texas Library Association conference annually. We always have what's called an alumni event, but we invite everybody that's currently <laughs> attending classes as well. So it's a, just a great opportunity to meet people in, in person and have a conversation uh, and, and do some get togethers. Um, we do try to encourage that as much as we can. COVID, as we all know, has just really thrown a wrench in some of those uh, plans, but nevertheless, Oh, there's a Janisha question. How many students are typically admitted each semester? <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I had mentioned this a little bit earlier um, that about our deadlines, uh, we do um, uh, we, we do have a uh, full caveat uh, for when our programs do reach capacity. Uh, the purpose for this is because uh, we need to make sure that we have enough courses offered for the amount of students that uh, come. Uh, that number does uh, actually fluctuate like per semester. Uh, there's a lot of additional factors that can go into, you know, uh, play uh, when it comes to um, with, uh, stopping uh, admitting into the program. Um, as of right now, uh, for the spring, we are about halfway there. There's a, a pretty high demand for our programs. Um, and then for the fall, uh, it's fair game <laughs> for, for both the fall and the summer where we're, you know, slowly but surely people are applying and getting admitted. Uh, but this is like, you know, a little bit further in advance. It just, it did, you know, it depends on what you would like to do. Um, as far as, um, I mean, I, I think when people usually ask this question, they're asking like, also like, am I gonna be like in a massive like concert hall of a class? And the answer is no, you will, <laughs> you will have like, you know, more like one-on-one -on -one with your teacher, uh, you know, if in your largest classroom, there's probably gonna be maybe 40 students and that's the absolute largest and they'll also have TA support. Um, and then of course, you know, you can always ask questions of like your program director and things of that nature, so. I will say the core courses are larger than 40 students, um, but yeah, the other courses outside of core will be 30-ish or less. I would like to add that even in the core courses where we have a lot of students, 
we make sure that you know not everybody is communicating with everybody because if you have a hundred students posting in the same discussion area, it's yeah, not uh, it's not going to be easy to follow. So uh, we divide the classes into small discussion groups where you actually get to have a meaningful conversation with your peers. So we make sure that it's a it's a it's a manageable experience. And we always offer the core courses every semester. Uh, same thing with the school library certification courses. We offer that full slate of coursework um, every semester. And we have enough demand uh, to do that. Um, so you don't have to worry for school libraries about a, a, a rotation. And we do have, I think, a very robust schedule of uh, ongoing coursework. Some of the electives, and I saw that uh, Dr. Zevelina posted the rotation schedule, so you'll be able to take a look at, uh, you know, how regularly the courses are offered. Um, as to when we would recommend beginning uh, the program, that, that really depends on, on you. I don't think that there is, uh, I, I should say that typically for uh, someone like a, a school librarian, they will want to be graduating in the spring, uh, summer. Uh, so they work it backwards in terms of how many courses can they take each semester realistically. Uh, so that they are able to graduate and be eligible for positions that, of course, begin in the fall. But uh, school library positions um, are the ones that begin in a fall semester. But for the other uh, library positions, they're available all year long. So it's really a starting in terms of a semester start. Yeah. Okay. I'm just watching all my oh, all my messages. I, I'm just going to <laughs> I, I sent a, a frantic message uh, to my teaching assistant to connect with either Dr. Zavalina or Rachel or Janan or somebody to tell you why I, <laughs> where I was. So she's just like, oh, I'm so sorry. I just got the message. <laughs> That's okay. Just tell her we're... <laughs> Technology, it's great. It's great when it works, isn't it? Okay, so... <laughs> Uh, that's why my hair is white. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, Oksana's. Yeah, I think I think two courses a semester is a more than an, more than enough. Uh, one is a comfortable load. But yes, Rachel, good point. You need a, a minimum of two uh, if you're um, applying for financial aid. Okay. Did we cover everything? Just, oops. I don't know if it was mentioned yet, but I wanted mm -hmm. to throw out there that you do have five years to earn the master's. Oh, um, so if you need to start and take some time off, you get a total of five years to complete the program. And any transfer courses that you may have would need to fit in within that five-year time frame. Yes, very good point. Because you don't want to time out. Um, Job opportunities after graduation, would going to in-person classes uh, be better for making uh, connections? That's a, that's a really interesting question. Uh, I think in some situations that, that, might be, uh, that might be the case. I see Dr. Piercy smiling because she's thinking of her, of her cohorts and uh, you know, making those, 
making those connections, but I, I don't think ultimately that one outweighs uh, the other because you will still be making connections. And uh, one thing that I have uh, really observed is that our online students make some very solid connections um, with each other as well, because you do bump into uh, you know, a lot of the same, the same folks in your, in your classes. Uh, Oh, okay. That's a that's a good question. If you, uh, yes, and Janisha has just answered that. So, if you applied this fall and got accepted for spring, could you decide to wait to start um, in the summer? Yeah, yeah, you could you could do that. You'd have to update your application, but yeah, you can do that. Okay. I think we might have we hey, might have covered hey, it. Rachel, um, uh, Stephanie has a question in the chat, and I can't remember for the life of me what's considered oh. part time versus full time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so part time is anything between like three to six hours, which is one to two courses, and then full time is nine hours. Some very ambitious oh. students can take. 12 hours the grad catalog doesn't cap them actually um, at that limit even but uh, we have some serious discussions before we um, we go through with the 12 hour workload let alone I mean a nine hour workload um, so yeah uh, three to six hours is part time and nine hours or more, more is part but have to have a serious talk with an advisor before you do more than nine hours. I'm just scrolling back to see that we've caught, but I think we've caught everything. Yeah. You can receive the financial aid with six credit hours, not with not with three. Yes. Yeah, it's technically it's five hours, but no, like none of our courses. <laughs> you can't. Yeah. <laughs> but you can't do that. <laughs> That's uh, funny math. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, for uh, some like uh, and this is a, a school librarian thing if you already hold a master's degree you can apply for the certification only uh, which means that you only do that set of um, courses uh, we highly recommend that uh, you apply for the full master's degree in any case because you can't be eligible for financial aid doing just the certification uh, courses, but you are eligible with six credit hours for the master's degree. And then there is no penalty if you decide that you're not going to complete uh, the master's degree. You're you know, going to stop with the, and add that certification to um, your existing master's degree. Although we highly recommend that you do complete it because the master's in information science in library science makes you uh, competitive and eligible for public library positions uh, beyond uh, school librarianship um, as well. And uh, yeah, Dr. Enoch is the uh, professor who coordinates the Houston program. He also teaches uh, one of the core courses, the information organization one. Ah, now scholarships. Um, the reason I'm pausing is I'm trying to think of the differences if any of them specify that you must be taking more than one. Not positive. 
we have we have a wide variety of uh, scholarships, and they all have their own, you know, sort of individual. Yeah, I don't know off the top of my head, but I will say that I know that some require a full course load, some require just two courses, yeah. but I think for most of them, they'll require at least two courses. Some may only require one, but you just have to check on the specific scholarship. Yeah, oh, thanks, Dr. Zevelin has put the, uh, the link in there. Yeah, it always depends on who has decided to offer the scholarship and, you know, they establish the funding um, criteria for that. Right. Okay, well, you're <laughs> just glad. I got to meet you all. <laughs> Thank you to our wonderful team who uh, started ahead without me. And uh, I apologize again. <laughs> Seriously. Um, well, you jumped in right on time and addressed so many questions. <laughs> oh, no, okay, good. Uh, it's crazy, isn't it? Uh, but we all prevail in the end. It all works out in the end. Okay, and uh, you're always welcome to contact us uh, as well. So uh, never worry about about that. We're always happy to answer questions and and help you any way that we can. So thank you very much for joining us and for uh, asking questions. Good questions. <laughs>